Welcome back to Shannon's Club TV, the program for all motoring enthusiasts to reflect on road and race histories of cars in Australia. In each episode, we look back on what made our feature car stand out and we take a road trip in an owner's well-preserved example. We'll also get the latest market updates from the Shannon's auctions team. So let's have a look at the Ford that some say could have beaten the EJ Holden, the Zephyr Mark III. The Ford Zephyr Mark III is not nearly as iconic in Australian automotive history as perhaps it ought to be. Although the 1962 Zephyr was assembled in Ford Australia's Broadmeadows factory, it might have been manufactured there with a much higher degree of local content and a significantly lower selling price, but for a decision taken in 1957. That was when a team of Ford Australia executives, led by then managing director Charles Smith, travelled to Dearborn to check out the Ford Zephyr Mark IIa, the car intended to be manufactured in the new Broadmeadows plant with the aim of challenging the supremacy of the Holden. But when Smith and his team were given a sneak preview of the forthcoming Falcon, they chose that car instead of the Zephyr. The Falcon certainly looked sleeker and more modern than the Mark IIa Zephyr, and importantly, it was lighter and would be less expensive to manufacture. Back to the Mark III, the 2.6 litre, 106 horsepower car made not only the Holden but also the XK Falcon seem like yesterday's cars. In every respect, the Zephyr's strongest local competitor was the Chrysler Valiant R Series. The Zephyr could also be compared with upspec cars like the Fiat 2300 and even the Mercedes Benz 220SE. Mark, it seems to me that the Mark III Zephyr was in many ways superior to the local Falcon and it, it did prove to be so on the racetrack, didn't it? Well, it certainly did in its first uh, race in the Armstrong 500 in 1962, um, where it was demonstrably faster than the Falcons, but had a bit of bad luck, which I'll get to a bit later on. It's interesting, though, that in those days, Ford was backing you know, Falcon entries and also backing a Zephyr entry. It was almost like it was hedging its bets because the Falcon program was in a lot of trouble Yes. And if that whole thing had failed, at least they had another reasonably high-profile car that could have taken over. It's interesting to look back on. Exactly. Mm. The Holden and Falcon had three-speed gearboxes with no synchro mesh on first. But the Zephyr had an all-synchro four-speeder and, amazingly, standard front disc brakes. That's because it was designed primarily for the more demanding British market. Given its mechanical sophistication, the Zephyr was let down a bit by unconvincing fake wood on the dash and poorly placed minor controls. In the disappointing Australian fashion of the time, there was no heater to mister or windscreen washers. Interestingly too, 1962 was of course the year of the Holden Premier and the Falcon Futura. In one sense, this pair wedged the Zephyr Mark III. Premiers were popular in Turak and Vaucluse as second cars. Their plush leather trim and Mercedes-like white steering wheel gave them a status that perhaps eluded the Zephyr. Now, a Ford Zodiac with leather and fashionable quad headlights could have written a different history. Mark, do you think the Zephyr Mark III actually achieved its potential in motorsport? No, it certainly didn't. Not in the Armstrong 500. But that was because of silly things like flat tyres and even a faulty bonnet latch. With a little luck, a Ford Zephyr Mark III could well have beaten Ford's XL Falcon to win the 1962 Armstrong 500 at Phillip Island. Admittedly, the Zephyr was a higher priced and more sophisticated offering and competing in a different class. But the works-backed entry shared by Jeff Russell and David Anderson posed a genuine threat for outright first-across-the-line honours. Its lusty inline-six was slitely smaller than the Falcon's 2.8-litre pursuit engine, yet produced more power with a higher top speed. The British car's full-synchro four-speed gearbox and front disc brakes were in another league compared to the Falcon's three speeds and four-wheel drums. The lone Zephyr was much faster than the Falcon's in the early stages, but something as simple as a faulty bonnet latch required several lengthy pit stops and the loss of four laps trying to fix it. Eventually, it failed at high speed and the bonnet flipped back onto the roof, requiring it to be lashed down with rope 
to allow the car to finish second in class and fifth outright. John, looking back on that was a blessing in disguise for Ford really because if that Zephyr had beaten Firth and Jane in the Falcon that day, you know, that would have inflicted even more pain on the Falcon's already struggling reputation, wouldn't it? Yes, I think it was a, a marketing dilemma for them because the car was in many, I believe, a much better car than the Falcon, but they, they couldn't come out and say that, could they? Because the Falcon was the one they wanted to sell in volume. So yes, as you say, I think it, perhaps it was a blessing in disguise. Mm. The Zephyr Mark III's involvement in the annual 500 mile production car race continued in 1963, when it moved to Mount Panorama, Bathurst. By then, Ford had replaced the Falcon with the Cortina GT as its outright contender. But the company still backed a Zephyr Mark III in the big car class for Jeff Russell and John Rayburn. This time it enjoyed a trouble-free run and holding a commanding class lead until suffering, of all things, a flat tyre with only one lap remaining. Again, another class win gone begging. A privately entered Mark III finished fourth in class in 1964, which was its third and final appearance in the 500 as it was soon quietly withdrawn from local showrooms. The Zephyr Mark III will always be remembered as a great car, but it could also have easily been a great race winner too. Remember to join the Shannons Club, where you can connect with other enthusiasts around the country. Hello, I'm Steve. This is a 1962 Mark III Zephyr 6 automatic. Inline six cylinder, 2.6 litre. Fourteen inch rims. The car was purchased second hand in 1963 by my father in law. Had about 8,000 miles on it at the time, and it's been in the family since. It was just unusual a vehicle at the time, and quite an advanced vehicle at the time. Beautiful to drive, plenty of room. It was painted just before it went into storage, advertised as the biggest boot space in the Australian market at the time. I've been with Shannon's now since the car has been back on the road approximately three years. Very accommodating, easy to get along with and a great value policy. Family memories of, of this car would be uh, holidays up on the Murray River. Just load the car up with everything we needed, the tent and everything. Everything would fit in the car. The future plans for the car is just to maintain it as it is, drive it and just enjoy the car. Well, Shannon's National Auctions Manager, Chris Borobon, joins us to bring us right up to date on the Ford Zephyr Mark III. Welcome to the show, Mark. Welcome, Welcome, Chris. The Mark III Zephyr. Now, I can remember when that came out, I thought it was a very exciting car and it nearly won at Phillip Island. And I'm imagining there'd be quite a few enthusiasts for these cars. Good question, John. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't see too many of them around today these days, unfortunately. Uh, quite stylish in here, though. I mean, they, they had that, you know, the small fin on the rear. Very, very different to the Falcon race. Very subtle, much very more subtle. subtle yeah, than the yeah, very cars. different car to the Falcon. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but, you know, we, we only got the CKD or the completely knocked down kits here, which were assembled yeah. locally. But it was a really good specification because we got the uh, the optional, the disc brakes, the four speed full synchro well, that's, that's, gearbox. Yeah. I mean, that was a a really good car for Australia in more ways than one because don't forget that Ford UK used to rally these cars in the East African Safari. That it was, was a pretty that solid. That was like hell on, hell on wheels. And a fairly high performance car, yeah. really. I mean, just think it would have won that race at Phillip Island if the bonnet hadn't been popping mm. open all the time. Well, well the, I think the Zephyr carried more horsepower than its mm. opposition here, so more horsepower than the Holden. 106 and, and horsepower, that's right, I think and it had. That's right, yeah. compared to the 75 horsepower from the Holden and oh, they're it. about similar figures from the for Ford that, as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it, it did carry more more. I think the only car that had more horsepower in that range was the Valiant, the R-Series. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that, that was probably the attractive part of it. 
with the Zephyr. So where, where, where does it sit today? I mean, we have, uh, you know, with the Holdens, we always talk about the Vauxhalls. Is it a similar relationship here with uh, with classic Falcons and, and Zephyrs? Is, is it that same sort of... Look, I think there's a diff different market for the Zephyr. And mm. I think the market for that, you know, the 62 Zephyr, the Mark III, was, is really a market that's carried across from the 50s. So I think the people who really got into the Zephyr initially, the Mark I and Mark II, that carried on into the, the Mark III Zephyr. So you're saying this is like a popular with the rockabilly sort of rock and roll sort of scene? I, I think for, for people who are into the 50s, you know, in the 50s Fords and, mm. and, and even some of the British cars have got a tendency for the Zephyr as well. Mm. It, was yep. a, it was a very difficult thing for Ford Australia because they couldn't really market the Zephyr because they were, would have had to market it against the Falcon, which they were establishing as the locally <sighs> manufactured car. They were between a rock and a hard place there, I think, weren't yeah, they? Because, they were. I mean, the Zephyr had front disc brakes, mm. four-speed gearbox. Mm. All where, synchro mesh. That's right, where the, the Holden and the Falcon we're still running a three-speed three gearbox. And drums. So yeah, and drums. Yeah. If they promoted these merits in the Zephyr, That's they're right. actually detracting from their, detracting from the their mainstream product. Yep. Yep. So where do you see it today? I mean, do you see many at the auctions or is this really sort of, a, I know there's a very enthusiastic club movement around Zephyrs. Yes. Is, is yep. that where these cars tend to change hands? Definitely. I think that's where you see them. You know, it is predominantly in the club. But, um, there is, you know, it's a limited size, yeah. you know, a limited audience for, mm, for sure. the Zephyr. Uh, but I think they're still popular amongst them. I mean, we see them in, a, you know, in classic touring rallies and still, and um, you'll see them at club events uh, and attend a lot of shows, so mm. yeah. Well, still a very good car, very practical classic. So if you wanted one, go to the, the car club scene. Absolutely, I think that's pro you know, the most likely place to find it. Best place to find it. Thanks, Chris. Remember, you can keep up to date with all the latest Shannon's auctions news on the Shannon's Club website. If you'd like your own competition image of the Ford Zephyr, visit the huge motorsport archive at autopix.com.au. It's interesting looking at this car, you know, where it was positioned in Ford's, Ford Australia's lineup in the early 60s. It really could have gone one way or the other, Falcon or Zephyr, couldn't well, it? Well, it, it was still the time when we were still talking about England as the mother country, mm. but really we were coming to the end of that time and looking more and more in all kinds of ways culturally mm. to the United States of America. US, so yeah. perhaps even if the Zephyr Mark III had been the car at the time, it, it would have led to the Falcon eventually anyway, I think. And it's interesting too to think about the fact that really the closest rival to the Zephyr was probably the Valiant. Mm. And the Valiant was as American as the Zephyr was English. Yeah, and yeah. It's, it's interesting with the styling too because the Falcon brought in that very clean, that new, yeah. clean-lined American look, whereas you look at the uh, the early Valiant, the R and the S series, and, and indeed the Zephyr Mark III, very very heavily stylized, which which was a style that was sort of yes. you know, looking a bit passe. Yes. So the Zephyr Mark III really was kind of a, a car right at the at the turning point yeah, in Australian it's... automotive history. Yeah, interesting yeah. car. Mm. We hope you've enjoyed reflecting on the Ford Zephyr Mark III, and we hope you can join us next time for Shannon's Club TV. Bye for now.